Welcome to Event Planning Blueprint TV. Today we're speaking with Rob Shank from Wedding Industry Law. In this video, you'll learn how to protect your intellectual property, why you should or shouldn't sign vendor contracts on behalf of your clients, how to get paid as an event planner, we'll talk about non-refundable deposits, and so much more. Rob's company, Wedding Industry Law, focuses on educating wedding professionals. As an author, Rob's expertise has been featured in Time Magazine, Petapixel, Huffington Post Weddings, The Knot, Wedding Market Chat, Above the Law, and Mobile Beat. He regularly speaks at wedding industry conventions nationwide on various legal topics, which include Wedding MBA, Mobile Beats Las Vegas, WPPI, and the Wedding Market Expo. Rob, welcome to Event Planning Blueprint TV, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, Melanie. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we are very excited about this conversation uh, for many reasons, but I, I often hear, you know, people complaining or talking about people stealing their intellectual property, their IP. What's the deal with um, non-refundable deposits? So let's, let's just get into it because I know people are really anxious to know how do they protect themselves. So really, I guess at the end of the day, that's what we're talking about, right? We're going to, how do you protect yourself as a, not just a wedding planner, but an event planner? Very good. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, from a broad standpoint, Melanie, um, I mean, one of the principal things that you can do is, as an event planner, is to have a written contract that both expresses the uh, basic legal protections, but also expresses uh, a lot of the um, nuances and intricacies of your particular business. So one event mm -hmm. planner is not going to function the same, it's not going to do the same things as the next event planner. And um, that should be reflected in the actual written um, vehicle that you provide to the client. The second thing is, you know, to stay out of trouble to what should event planners do is to watch the conduct, be cool, uh, communicate with the client openly if there's a problem. And those mm -hmm. are two of the broad basic strokes that I see in my experience of what leads into trouble, not having a contract that's expressive of the things that it needs to be expressive of and event planners disappearing or being total jerks. I love that. You know, communication yeah. is often overlooked, especially when it gets into a heated situation or money is involved. You know, everyone gets very protective all of a sudden, gets their back up. Um, but also, I like that you just said, you know, not all contracts fit all event planners. And, uh, you know, I think often, especially if people are just getting started or they're just maybe they've been in the event industry for a while, but they're starting their own business. Um, and so they have to get those contracts for the first time or get them um, prepared for the first time. They think, well, why can't I just like download something or use this contract or write my own? And it doesn't always work that way. Correct. So and that's very important. Number one is, you know. For an event planner or really anybody in the wedding or event industry to download a contract or to borrow a contract or to find it in the gutter somewhere in the garbage, you know, that's <laughs> the equivalent of, hey, my cousin is going to plan my wedding or my event. I don't need a professional. That's mm -hmm. about the same thing. There are going mm -hmm. to be concepts. There are going to be intricacies with the law that you might not know that you don't know and that you're not getting in those things that you download. That's why it's important. I, I really advise that if you can, if you're starting your business, or maybe if you've been in it a long time, to spend a little bit of money to either A, have a, an attorney local to your area, talk to them a little bit and draft you a contract specifically for you, mm -hmm. or at least go to a site, and there are several of them online, um, and for event planners, download a template and start from there. But in terms of finding something in the gutter or something like that, it's probably not a good idea because there's going to be things that you're not aware of. Right. I think um, that's for the most part. Yeah, that's good advice. And uh, you know, I often get asked about contracts, and I'm not a lawyer. I don't claim to be. You know, I, I wish I had the knowledge around you're it. You're so lucky. <laughs> Well, that, that's debatable. Um, it's funny because I actually wanted to be a lawyer at one point, but I just didn't. I was like, I'm, I'm more of an action taker. I don't want to sit and go to school for like four more years. <laughs> I've already done that. So um, anyway, we kind of got sidetracked. But <laughs> <laughs> that's what, what, we, kind of, that's what you, what did you want to do? Were you like a prosecutor? You like saw law and order and that's what you wanted to do? What kind of lawyer oh, did you that's want a, to be? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know if it was around 
Yeah, I don't know if I even got that deep into it. I think, you know, sometimes it's the discovery process. Even when I started my event business, I wasn't entirely sure what kind of events I wanted to plan. But I just, once I started, I realized this is what I love doing. And I went that way. So gotcha. I think it was kind of more, a bit more general, like, oh, I want to be a lawyer. I don't know. Okay. It doesn't get much fun much farther than that. So gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that didn't happen. So here we are. And I love doing this. Um, all right. So just getting back to the contracts, uh, I think it, it is a really good point that, you know, there are so many pieces to the contract and being, um, being specific to your locale is really important as well, because in some states or provinces or depending on where you live, some rules apply and some don't. That's exactly right. Um, we luckily live in the land of federalism. So what is good for the residents and citizens of California might not be necessarily what the residents of uh, Florida or Georgia like. Right. And so therefore we have, we have 50 different state legislatures that draft 50 different types of laws that apply to contracts. And mm -hmm. so an example of that would be, um, so for example, in California, it is, illegal to have your client agree in the in the at the outset to not give you a bad review or non disparagement clause mm -hmm. in an actual the contract that the client signs. You can't do that in California anymore by order of, of, of a state law. Um, it provides hefty fines. In Georgia, Florida, those don't exist. You can pretty much adults can contract around any way they like, um, as long as it's not illegal or drugs, things like that. Um, and so for example in New York, um, generally in the law, in other states, uh, particularly in the South, um, you a normal, an average person, I won't say a normal person, we're all normal, an average person, non-celebrity, non-public person does not really have very much rights in their um, persona, in their likeness. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore, the right to privacy in terms of misappropriation of your likeness, if somebody puts your image on a cereal box or whatever, you're not going to be able to get that much of damages. But in New York, Specifically, New York has uh, uh, enacted statutes that more heavily protect the average person from uh, the misappropriate, the lawsuit for misappropriation of likeness. So that's a couple of examples of how. Um, oh, are you get your windows clean. Ah, that's you can wild. see them. Yes. Oh, that was scary. Somebody's repelling down the SWAT team or something. Okay. Yeah, anyway, I know. So. It's of all the days we choose to do this, and they're, they're doing window cleaning, and there's actually supposed to be a thunderstorm in like the next two hours, so Ooh, I don't nice. know why they're no, up man, there. Good. Blame <laughs> it on the rain, baby. Billy, Millie Vanilli. Right. No, so I was just going to say, like, that's you know, just two simple examples of how, how rights and responsibilities and contractual obligations can can be different from state to state. Right. Yeah. And so I think it just goes to show that it's it's worth it when you're getting started or actually no matter what stage of your event business you're in, spend a little extra money, however you have to get that money, you know, work with more clients, save the money, but spend it on getting a really good contract that is specific to you and your events and where you live. Yeah, because I mean, I, I always say that the, 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 the days of having to to plop down a whole ton of money to an attorney to work for you by the hour, those days are gone. Mm -hmm. um, there are over a million attorneys in the United States. Um, there are a growing number of business attorneys that, that concentrate and specialize in the event industry that are more or less young, hip, willing to work for the dollar. I'm not young and hip. I used to be hip and I used to be young, but well, maybe not <laughs> hip. I don't know. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, so that anyway, um, but that will be willing to work for you. Um, work out arrangements with them. You know, billable hours are gone for contractual matters. Pay a flat fee to somebody, find somebody, do research, kick the tires. Like your clients do for you. You do that for the attorney. That's what I say. Like try to find somebody in your area that's willing to work for you. That's cool. That's awesome. So, I, I'm, I really want to point that out to all of our listeners and our watchers or viewers um, that it just get that whole idea out of your head that it's going to cost you so much money, like thousands of dollars to get your contract drawn up. You know, I have a rule when I go and I look for contractors or vendors or anyone that I'm working with, even if I'm, I mean, I'm not getting new windows here. I live in a, a condo building, so I'm not responsible for that. But, you know, if I was in a house, I go and I get three to five quotes from people. And I do that for a couple of reasons because it gives me a good idea, especially if I don't really have a, a baseline 
um, then it gives me a good idea of what I'm looking at. Am I comparing apples to apples or apples to oranges? Um, and what's reasonable to be charged for this? So, you know, if, if you think that it's going to cost you thousands of dollars, think again. No, no, yeah. no. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You're yeah, absolutely right. I, it shouldn't it, cost you that much and it shouldn't. somebody that's competent. Absolutely. Yeah, so let's get into, um, you know, this was just asked, of me the other day in one of my programs about non-refundable deposits and how those work for event planners. So let's sure. talk a little about that. Um, a non-refundable deposit, the law is going to refer to anything, any money that the event planner keeps in the event that the, the in just in the event that the event <laughs> is canceled. Um, the law is going to refer to that as a liquidated damages clause. Liquidated damages simply means that the professional and the client are agreeing at the outset that if the event is canceled, that event or the cancellation will technically be a breach and my compensation, my damages uh, in that event will be what I have in my hands. That's the point of the liquidated damages. It's so that the professional does not have to file a lawsuit for breach of contract and collect money. The two people are agreeing, this is how we're calculating the damages, this is how it's going to be. So um, now that's the general definition of it, okay? Mm -hmm. So how does it work, how can it work for wedding professionals? So I'm sorry, event, event planning professionals. Um, it depends a lot on how the event planner gets paid. I've seen different planners do it different ways. So for example, some planners will, you know, kind of like a, when the painter comes to your house and, you know, looks around and it's like, okay, that'll be $5,000 flat fee. And if it takes them 4 million gallons of paint or if it takes them one gallon of paint, it's the $5,000. Some planners do it that way. Some planners will say, I will take a percentage of the overall budget and that will be ironed out later. Or I'll do it in incremental payments that are left up to, to some other, um, attribute mm -hmm. or characteristic of the, of the event. There's different ways that you can do it. There's hybrids that you can do it. Okay. Um, depending on how you do it, I recommend that the professional based on how they plan based on their out of pocket time and expenses, um, do incremental payments that are non-refundable. That's that, that is something that I preach on the event and wedding circuit often is to take incremental payments. Okay, so incremental payments that are non-refundable. And do you recommend that they space them like 30 days out, 60 days out? What kind of, what, what structure have you seen that works really well? Great. Um, it's going to depend on the event planner. So all too often I see event planners and just event professionals in general take a certain amount the day of the signing of the contract and then the rest the day of the event. That leaves the event planner too exposed. Okay, so first of all, if the client the day before the wedding says, look, I know I'm supposed to have you the second payment. I'm not going to have it. Would you mind just going ahead and finishing up and I'll pay you later? That puts the planner in the position of having to chase the money. And I always say don't chase the money. So from that standpoint, that's probably not good. So incremental payments um, are good. But you have to, as the event planner, calculate the amount of liability that you have during the duration of the contract. Okay, so what that means is that. What you want to do is you want to figure out, so if you sign somebody 18 months in advance, okay, the day after you sign the contract, you don't have that much liability, that much exposure because you could easily just try to find somebody else to book because you're 18 months ahead. Does that make sense? Yep. So, but that liability for being able to rebook the date is going to slowly erode to where you have no ability to rebook the date 30 days in advance mm. or 15 days in right. advance. Okay. Mm. So that's one component of how to figure out how much you want to get. The other component is what your out of pocket time and expenses are. So again, the day after you sign that contract, you probably haven't talked to the, to the client or you haven't lifted your finger to do anything. Okay. That amount of out of pocket time and expense, hiring secondary people, all that kind of stuff changes and erodes to the day before you've done all of the work and you've got all the out of ex pocket expenses. So you, as you, you as the event planner need to figure out what, where the bulk of your work is, is transpiring and where mm -hmm. you, you know, if you at some point during that life of that contract have to pay somebody else, make sure that you're paid by the client before you hand the money to a secondary assistant or something like that. So you as the planner need to figure out what percentages work for you based on your ability to rebook the date 
and your out-of-pocket time and expenses. So it might be 30%, 30%, you know, 40% or whatever it is. It just it depends. It'll yeah. depend. So it's kind of important. What I'm hearing is it's important to keep track of what you're doing, what tasks you're doing, how long they take you, um, so that you can really calculate where to collect m the majority of the money. Correct. So some planners that I've talked to, like pretty much once the, um, you know, what do you call it? The RSCPs go out. They've mm -hmm. pretty much done everything. Right. And they're, they're just, just chilling out yeah. for the next however long. Yeah. And so maybe they want to have mo a majority of their money collected by then. Some, mm -hmm. it's going to be they do a bulk of their work day of. And so, again, you, you want to be protected. At the end of the day, I, don't, I do not think that it's a good idea for planners to be accepting money day of or even two weeks out because the chances of you – the, the, of the of the of the event either being canceled or the, them not paying you for whatever reason it could be a great reason I don't, I don't or not a great reason but like you know <laughs> like you know somebody died or I got you know I, I lost my job or whatever it's not their fault you're still going to do the work and you're going to end up chasing the money right yeah life happens so I think I think that's a great piece of advice yeah. um, and just kind of in that vein but a little bit what happens you know you mentioned about when people don't get paid for whatever reason you know life happens things happen and sometimes people are just dishonest and that's very rare in my opinion and in my experience but what happens or at what point do you, does an event planner sue over breach of contract if the event planner's contract the liquidated damages clause is constructed in an appropriate way, mm -hmm. generally that will waive the planner's ability to sue for the remainder. Because again, that is what the planner and the client have agreed to beforehand, that if the event is canceled, then I'm not going after you for the rest, but I'm keeping what I have, and we're going to call that a day. What, what, to, to Specifically to your point where the client maybe just doesn't want to pay – or maybe it's not a cancellation, they're just not paying you, yeah. then you have to figure out whether or not it's going to be worth you chasing that money. So in order to get money from a client, you're going to have to – and you've we've bypassed all the means of, hey, pretty please, will you please do this? You've sent the letter. You've cried about it. You've texted them over and over again, and they disappeared. To get the money from them, you're going to have to file a lawsuit for breach of contract to get that money. Then you have to show up, prove there was a contract, all the things that go with litigation, get a judgment. Once you get a judgment, all that is is a piece of paper saying client owes you X amount. Then you got to collect on it. And unless you're suing Walmart or a client that's somehow self-insured, they don't they're they're not gonna just gonna cut you a check and have to garnish wages or whatever if they don't want to pay you. And all of that is crap. I hate it. It's not a good process. I started off in my career doing almost exclusively business litigation and it always amounts to the client has to quit because they run out of money because they're mm -hmm. giving all the money to me so that I can chase the money from somebody else. You're throwing good money after bad. No, yeah, after bad. Yeah. Or the opposite. I can't remember how that works, but you see what I'm saying. Yeah. So um, it usually is not a good idea. That's why the contract is so important and that's why it's so important for your conduct to be such that if the client is late, remind them. If they if they, if they don't want to pay you, you got to bounce because you don't want to sink more money and time in them because ultimately you're not going to sue them for the remainder. Right, and or nobody it's, it's not going to be economically feasible. Yeah, nobody wants to sue, and for many reasons, not just monetary reasons, but I think it also just proves like what you just said about having incremental payments why that is so important because if, if you're going to run into a problem halfway through at least then you know and you're not going to spend another you know month two months three months six months or even a year and depending on the type of events you're planning um working for this client if they're not going to be paying you exactly right exactly and so let's just say something does happen and something comes up, um, whatever it is, whether it is a lack of payment um, or defaulting on payments, how do you legally fire a client if or when you need to? Excellent question. So I'm, I've been getting this question a lot. How do you fire clients, seeing it in, in blogs and stuff like that? So from a legal standpoint, Firing a client can – it's really – it's a matter of whether or not there's a breach of contract. Mm -hmm. you, we, we can't just say, hey, I don't like you anymore, so we're, we're going we're gonna to waive this contract and I'm going to be out of here. Because 
if it, the only way that you can fire, i.e., discharge your duties under that contract, is if there's been a material a, a material breach on the other side. So mm. whether or not there's a material breach is generally left up to a fact finder being either a jury or a judge. So you're in dangerous grounds um, just saying, you know, lady or man or whatever your client is, you're going to your client and saying you are being extremely crazy, shady. I don't like your attitude. You're calling me all times of night, so I'm going to go my separate ways. <clears throat> you would only be able to do that if that's a material breach, okay, material being something that's so hardcore to the contract that it discharges your duty, okay? And again, like I said, um, that's ultimately going to be decided by somebody down the road. So that's dangerous. So what an event planner can do is define what material means in the contract. Mm -hmm. And again, it, words are powerful. Words are very important. So I would not advise doing this by yourself. But you can say things like, if you call me at 3 in the morning, material breach, immediately this this contract is, is terminated. That's just a weird example, but you can do things like that. Payment is material and is a t and time is of the essence for payments. That mm -hmm. makes payment material and then you can leave. If you do not have words like that in there, then you firing the client would leave the, the planner susceptible to a breach of contract against them, against, against the planner. So you really need to think about your parameters as well. Like I think, you know, you said it was a weird example about someone calling you at three in the morning, but that happens all the time. People expect you to be on call 24 seven. And, you know, during the event, maybe that is the case, but then those planning stages, not necessarily right. And you need to, you also have to set your own boundaries. So you really have to think about what your parameters are in order to put those right words or those correct words into place in your contract. That's exactly right. I mean, and again, like I said, every prof every industry is different. So event planning is different from photography. And even right. within event planning, event planner A is going to be different from event planner B. So it's important for clients to know that. And generally, you should have that outlined in whatever packages that you offer. Like 24-hour service is platinum versus don't ever call me ever is the bronze package or whatever it is. But yeah. let's flip the script on that for a second. The planner is technically in breach of contract if they're five minutes late to a meeting. Mm -hmm. The planner is in breach of contract technically if maybe the you know the placards or whatever it is are are not spelled correctly or they're responsible for the color and the color is wrong. Little things, right? So the client can say, "Well, I'm not paying you any more of the money because you are five minutes late." Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out, you know, that's 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 highlighting what we're talking about on the other side. Right. So these little things that the client might think is little, but you're talking about, I'm, I'm firing you. So again, yeah. those things need to be set at the outset. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I think it, it kind of brings up a good point, at least for me in my head. Um, it's really important to have these contracts in place. And I know we're talking about things like, oh, okay, five minutes. That sounds so crazy. And all of a sudden, you know, the whole event is gone and the, you're in breach of contract or your client's in breach of contact, contract. But what? It's really, really important, like Rob just said, to just have that conversation at the beginning. And it kind of goes back to what you said at the very beginning of this conversation. Communication is key. These are all just pieces to protect yourself, not to use them against your clients or for them to use them against you. You really want to, it's about building the relationship. Um, this is, you know, worst case scenario kind of stuff I think we're talking about here. Um, but it's important still to have it in the contract, go through it. And just so everybody's on the same page, it's not to get everyone's get everyone you know panicked or angry or anything like that. So true. Are you sure that you're not a lawyer? That was very <laughs> well said. See, maybe I should have been. <laughs> My next career. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I'll do. Uh, I don't know industry uh, industry. Uh, sorry, law industry TV on YouTube. <laughs> Nice. I'll watch it. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's just switch gears a little bit because I, I know for me, this comes up a lot and it's about protecting your intellectual property, your IP. Um, and you know, this comes up personally for me because event planning blueprint mostly is IP, almost all of it. Um, but what about for event planners who say have photos, whether they've hired a vendor or not, where it's their own photos and people are stealing them from Facebook um, or any anywhere else and they're using them as their own how can event planners or wedding planners protect their intellectual property right so from the outset 
um, the event planner in order to get those images. I highly recommend that in the contract you get permission from the client to do that. Um, there's a lot of times where the principal photographer has the exclusive right to capture an event, and when the event planner brings their own camera or their own people to photograph it, there becomes trouble. So in your contract, you need to make sure that the client not only gives you the permission to photograph the event, but warrants and represents to you that them allowing you to do that will not interfere with any other contract that they have uh, executed per uh, specifically with the with the principal photographer. With that being said, so let's assume that you're in the right to photograph the event, mm -hmm. and you have photographed those. Uh, you have taken those photographs, and you are the quote unquote copyright owner of them. Okay, um, and somebody and you post those on your website or whatever, and then somebody else takes them, right, and puts them on on their site. Um, the the what you can do is going to be determined almost exclusively on whether or not you've registered your copyright in those images with the copyright office. So let's do a 40,000 foot view so I don't put everybody to sleep. Um, but whenever you express an idea into a medium, that is to say, if you've taken that photograph, if you've wrapped the rap song and put it on a CD, if you've written that beautiful poem and it's on a piece of paper, that is automatically copyrighted, okay? If it's a true original expression of an idea, okay? The amount of protection you're afforded with that is pfft, unless you register your mm. copyright with the copyright office, okay? So that process is super simple. Like they've designed it, copyright.gov or whatever the site is, I don't know it offhand, but go there, it's cheap, and you would register it. And once you've registered your copyright mm -hmm. and somebody else is using your images and you have the copyright on those images, then you can get actual damages, meaning you know whatever the value is that, you, that they're getting from that, you can get that. You can get Sometimes you get treble damages, which is to say automatic damages just because they took it, things like that. It gives you a little bit more powerful leverage to find an attorney because when you register your copyright and somebody's infringing on it, they have to pay your attorney's fees. It's one of the few times in the law where the, the people don't have to pay their own attorneys. The losing party in that case would have to pay you. So that's what I would recommend is register your copyrights. If it's something you want to protect, register it. Right. So if you are a wedding planner or an event planner and whether or not you hire a photographer or use your own, it's, it makes sense to register those. Right. And so can you do that um, in bulk or do you have to do it per piece it's you can do it in bulk so like i've seen um i haven't seen any event planners copywriting images cause, uh, just because i haven't been privy to that but with wedding planners my clients that are that are weddings, wedding photographers they'll do it by depending on how many weddings they photograph mm -hmm. they'll do it by season so like it might be like spring 2016 and it'll be five thousand images okay Got it. um there's you know there's no you um, if you did it by decade your ability to to protect that might be a little bit more difficult like mm -hmm. if you only do one image i'm not to go into the minutia of it but the, the the less you do it once the more highly protected it would be in terms of chasing it but again disclaimer i'm not an intellectual property attorney specifically i know enough to be dangerous but yes you can do it by bulk Okay, so just okay. just we'll just give it at that. Yeah, we'll yeah, just a, yeah. It was just a general question, um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's good. And then also, I mean, if if you're maybe just have a few pictures that you want to protect, something as simple as a watermark works well as well, right? Maybe, well, not, uh, not yeah, to the well, extent of a copyright. A watermark, <laughs> sure. So what a watermark will do. Is there okay? So there are different types of infringement. Sometimes the infringement is like, dude, I didn't know. I thought it was open source, or you know, the infringer is saying I had no idea. I'm so sorry, whatever. If there's a watermark, it makes it more difficult for a defense of I'm so sorry that I didn't mean to do this mm -hmm. um, to be made. So you know, the damages are a big component to copyright infringement, and the higher the, the where it's willful infringement, the damages are higher. So it makes it easier as the copyright owner to argue willful infringement if there was a watermark and then like crop the watermark out. Like, you know, like, uh, I knew you, I know you knew it was me. And then you get a little bit more damages. Got it. 
Got it. Okay. All right. So again, worst case scenarios, we're talking about people who totally want to be asses. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this kind of can let's we're going to swing a little bit again because you brought up vendors. Um, and, you know, obviously, as an event planner, you're going to be working with a ton of vendors um, or a wedding planner. You're going to be working with a ton of vendors. And do you think it's in the best interest of the event or wedding planner to sign those vendor contracts on behalf of your client? Well, it's going to depend on what kind of event you you're operating. So some planners do turnkey. So meaning that the planner is the, is the only person that interacts with the client and the planner acts as a general contractor and contracts with the remaining people. Okay. That's one way you can do it. Um, the other way to do it is as the planner, you're putting the hands of the client into the hand of Baker or into the hand of the florist themselves. And you're just doing the introductions and all the payments, all the all the contract negotiation handles between the client mm -hmm. and the actual specific vendor. OK, there are advantages to doing it the second way. Um, so I try to recommend to the clients. But again, it's going to depend on what kind of operation that you want. But for the most part, most of my event planning clients don't do turnkey events. They're just one component in a grand scheme of things. And while they recommend vendors and they can get discounts and things like that, they don't want to be ultimately responsible mm -hmm. for the work of the vendors. And that's what happens when the event planner is doing a turnkey style event. So let's, 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 oh, let's unpack that for a second. So the planner that signs all the contracts and is basically directing the work of the other vendors, they're responsible. It's just like a general contractor building a house. Um, the client is only is going to want to sue the general contractor if something goes wrong. Okay. We're talking about breach of contract. We'll talk about liability in a second, but we're talking about whether or not the things are done correctly. The client is only going to need to sue the planner in a turnkey style thing because the planner is saying I'm responsible for everybody doing their stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, when the, um, the planner does it the other way, the way that I'm recommending, and they're just putting the hand of the client into the hand of the individual vendor. They're doing their own contract. The vendor is not responsible for the breach of contract for the most part, unless facts as a default, they're not responsible for it. Okay. There are going to be facts where they might be. Um, but I recommend on the contract, the planner say, look, I'm only recommending these vendors. I do not, you know, I'm not going to oversee their work in terms of like the quality um, only in the component of the event planning, but then you're not responsible in terms of if they mess up. If the florist puts the wrong thing on the cake or, or, or the baker puts the wrong thing on the cake or whatever it is, not responsible for it. Okay. With the turnkey style event, the planner is going to be ultimately responsible regardless because they're the ones that are signing all the contracts and they're the ones that are overseeing the work, if that makes any sense. That's why if you're going to be doing that as a planner, it needs to be financially a good idea. In other words, high contract value mm -hmm. and you're covering all your bases. Right. Yeah. And, and again, it goes back to getting those incremental payments and stuff too because you're responsible for making sure that everyone's paid on time mm -hmm. and all money goes through you. Exactly. Yeah. I've done it both ways in my event career and I definitely prefer not have signing the vendor contracts. Um, it makes it easier for everybody, but you still have to be the liaison between your vendor and your clients and making sure that the clients know when the vendors need to be paid and, and making sure that that does happen. That's correct. And that's a good, that's a good way to put it is that you're, it, it's, it's recommended. I think it's a better, it's less, liability and less risk if you're the liaison as opposed to the commander in chief. Right. Yeah. Well, Rob, we have talked about so many great things here and um, I would like for you just to share one piece of advice that you would give all event and wedding planners. A good piece of advice that I would give all wedding and event planners. Um, I, I think that at least for, for in the past few months, what I've been seeing is is planners that have hidden the ball when something goes wrong. Mm. Um, I always advise that you want to, as a planner or as a professional in any way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. you want to be open and upfront with clients immediately as soon as something goes bad or maybe it goes a little bit south. Okay, um, and the reason that you want to do that is because generally in the law, 
you have either a breach of contract action for the mess up or a tort for the mess up. Generally, there's not both. And a tort is a civil wrong that's not a breach of contract. So defamation, intentional infliction of emotional distress, misrepresentation, bad things, okay? And generally when a wedding professional or event professional or event planner hides the ball on something, it's going to be easier for that client later on to argue not only is this a breach of contract, but that planner misrepresented or intentionally withheld it to make me emotionally distressed and the tort world and the breach of contract world combined. And that's important. And you don't want that as a planner because um, the damages involved in a breach of contract action are much different than those in a, a tort action. In a tort action, um, case law supports you know lots and lots of money um, as an award for when the planner um, – does intentional infliction, emotional distress, or is is found liable for misrepresentation. So don't hide the ball. Do the best you can in communication and give options and value propositions to the client uh, if there is a mess up. Again, I think it all goes back to, like you said, communication. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, that is the key, becoming a master There's, communicator. I, I'm going to make this stat up, but it I, I'll, a principal portion of my practice area is dedicated to personal injury trial work. Mm -hmm. And there's a stat out there, and I can't remember what it is, but you can look it up, whatever it is. But with medical malpractice and people suing doctors, like it's something like 80%. Again, I made that up. But I've a majority this. of people don't sue their doctor, even though they have messed up their bodies. Mm -hmm. If the doctor was nice yeah. and apologized, yes. it's amazing. Yes. It's the stat. If it's the bedside manner of the doctor has a direct influence of whether or not they're going to be super for malpractice. Not that they're good, because everybody messes up, but it's their attitude after the mess up. Right. And I've seen that as well. I don't remember what the uh, percentage is as well. But yeah, but you know what I'm saying. But I know about. exactly yeah. what you're talking yeah. about. And yeah, you're right. It's nice and you apologize and you move on. I've seen some people where they apologize and they apologize and they keep bringing it up. Don't do that. That's oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like apologize, do it sincerely. Fix it. Move on. Exacto mundo. Yeah. 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 And so um, just before we close out here, how can people get in touch with you? Um, do you prefer if it's just wedding planners and or event planners? Um, how do they contact you if they want to use your services? Um, luckily, event planning and, and wedding uh Wedding planning generally run along the same things in terms of legal obligations and, and, and business rights and obligations. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to be pretty much the same. But either way, either your event planners or the wedding planners um, can contact me through my website, which is weddingindustrylaw.com. And just right. go to the contact page. It's my number, and you can email me and stuff like that. Um, I also have another website, which is wed forms.com which is wed w e d forms with a z f o r m z dot com okay. which offers contract templates to download awesome amazing and i will put your um wedding industry law link down below the video as well so people Fantastic. Can, can contact you um along with the disclaimer which tells everyone where you work which states you work in yes so yeah so that's important to <laughs> just to recognize which states rob can and cannot work in all right Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Rob, thank you so much for all no, this thank you. incredible information. You know, as going as we're talking, I'm thinking, gosh, there's so much information here. And people are probably going to have to listen to this a few times, which is totally okay. I highly recommend doing that. Um, but what am I going to title this one? Because there's so many good tidbits. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to think about that one for a little while. Just, just a w bald wedding lawyer talks for an hour. Right. That's what you can name it. <laughs> Perfect. It's good for Google searches. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So thank you guys so much for watching us. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to Event Planning Blueprint TV. And uh, if you know other event planners, and I'm sure you do, who could use this information, make sure that you share it through social media. And of course, if you haven't joined me at eventplanningblueprint.com, come on over and sign up for our free weekly advice so you get uh, first or get all this information, including our videos. You're the first one to get it. That really didn't come out very well, <laughs> but we're going to leave it at that. So have an amazing day. Again, thank you, Rob, and uh, we'll see you guys again soon.